thank you very much. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Um, I don't get out enough, although I'm sure if you come to Prony, you would think I was always here. So um, um, I need to start, first of all, by issuing a slight caveat in that um, this work here that I'm going to be talking about and uh, the first police women in Belfast is not really my um, my skill set. It's not really my primary source of expertise. I'm really a historian of 19th century religion and um, uh, particularly Protestantism and um, it was in doing research into the uh, history of Presbyterian deaconesses that I stumbled upon um, uh, one of the police women who will feature today, a woman called Jane Bell. And that was what then brought me into contact with Charlotte Murta and Margaret Cameron, my great friends from the RUCGC Historical Society. And so I want to make sure that they get credit too for a lot of the work that's been, um, that I'll be talking about here, um, and many other people as well. So this is me standing very much on the shoulders of giants. Um, but I hope adding a bit of um, a new picture to um, what we're, um, of what we know about um, early female police officers in Ireland. Uh, so, um, I wanted to start off with this iconic photograph. It's one of the few photographs of um, uh, what is called, well, I should start maybe by saying that this photograph, um, taken probably around 1943, is of Margaret Macmillan um, there in the center, um, and the first women police of the RUC. It appeared in a book called Arresting Memories, um, Captured Moments in Constabulary Life in 1982, put together by two members of uh, the RUC at the time. And you can see that they clearly labeled that photograph First Women Police. Um, Margaret was Scottish. She had been uh, working in London as part of the London Metropolitan Women's Police uh, branch. And um, as a result of, um, in essence, she was headhunted um, uh, by uh, senior RUC officers and uh, brought to Belfast to help them set up their women's police branch. Um, and um, a lot of the impetus behind this movement here was the role of the Second World War. Um, uh, some forward-thinking police officers who felt that uh, there needed to be more women within the police force and the demands of wider community and social welfare groups like the Belfast Council of Social Welfare, which we would all know as Bryson House, um, and their concerns that women needed to be uh, more present within the police force, particularly during wartime. Now, it may be difficult for us to understand why wartime is such an anxiety, and uh, part of the reason is this notion of what was called back then khaki fever, where, because in England, with all of the men now in uniform, everyone believed that the girls would go crazy and would leave house and home behind and chase off after the nearest uniform that they saw. Now, this sort of... And so you hear lots in the discourse and in the literature around in the First World War and in the Second World War, too, about women, uh, girls losing their heads, um, huge excitement um, and disruption occurring as a result. Okay? Um, in essence, people were worried about um, uh, sexual freedoms and, uh, and all sorts of sexual license uh, taking place. And the idea was then that if we had women in the police force, they would be able to manage this behavior. Now what's kind of interesting is, is that this photograph doesn't show that there were already, and at that very moment, two women working as policewomen, sometimes called constables, um, in Belfast at the time this photograph was taken. One of them was Jane Bell, who had been a, a policewoman since 1918, and the other was Catherine Carton, who had been a policewoman since 1940. There had been two other women who had served um, as policewomen within the RUC, um, but they had already resigned. Now it's true that the terms and conditions for the, these women were very different. The new women who are here in their uniforms were employed on RUC police pay scales. They had warrant cards, which meant that they had the power of arrest from the start. Whereas Jane Bell and Catherine Carton were on a civil service pay grade, 
They, uh, for much of their careers, they had not had the power of arrest. That had only been granted to them in 1938. Um, and so their terms and conditions were quite different. Their uniform as well had been much more informal um, than these women's here. But this lecture is really about them, about the two of them and the other two women, and uh, like them and a few more, and what their careers can really tell us about women's work and what they can tell us about how women tried to access traditionally male um, uh, occupations in the early 20th century. And I've been thinking all this week um, about the notion of change and how change takes place within our wider society. And I'm thinking about that in particular in relationship to the, um, the campaign for the suffrage. Because as we all know, in 1918, women didn't get the vote right away, right? It was property holders over the age of 30. And it was really a number of years later before every 18-year-old girl without a property qualification had the right to vote. So these sorts of processes take time, and this kind of transitional period is very much what we're looking at here when we come to look at female policing. Because the early women, the first women police, are probably not what we would call now policemen, or um, in the formal sense of the word. Um, but they certainly were doing police-type work in police-type conditions, um, and I think as such then, I'm very happy to call them a policewoman, regardless of where their salaries came from. Um, these, uh, and like I said, because of this sort of marginalization of them, because they didn't have powers of arrest, um, uh, they were, have, they've often, I think, been sidelined or disregarded um, in what is a growing interest in women's policing by historians and cultural commentators of all kinds. Um, and, but um, we need to really consider and see these women as part of a gradual transition or evolution towards um, women's um, occupations of uh, male professions. Um, so, what I want to do now, really, then, is to um, take a bit of a break and um, go back and provide you with a bit of background to what I'm talking about, and then have a look at some of these Belfast women. So this is kind of how the talk's going to go today. Um, and uh, I heard that there were some police members of the police in the, in the audience, so I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that um, policing is not my... Uh, is, is not my background. Nevertheless, so, so it was just to really give a popular background then for everybody about um, policing in Ireland and how it worked in the 19th century and the changes that were taking place in the early 20th century, and in particular then about what policing was like um, uh, in Belfast. So in the 19th century, there was a time when there were no police on the island of Ireland. You had soldiers and um, uh, you didn't have any police officers at all. There may have been an, an, um, a constable of some way, shape or form, but it wasn't really until 1822 when Sir Robert Peel um, created what was called the Irish Constabulary, that we really have the emergence of the modern police force as we know it today. Now historians have talked a lot about how this police force, because of the particular circumstances of Ireland, the British government governing, um, governing a, a rebellious population in Ireland, that it took on board a sort of semi-military character and it had a sort of a semi-military hierarchy um, and it was armed and um, occupied barracks and used this sort of military type language. And this certainly was probably the case um, at the beginning. Um, but by 1840, um, there were about 8,500 members of the, what was called the Irish Constabulary. And by the 1860s, it had reached roughly the size that it would be for the rest of the century, which was about 10 to 11,000 men. They were dispersed across 1,600 <coughs> stations um, across the island of Ireland. And then in 1867, because of the role that they had played in quelling the Fenian Rebellion, they were granted the title Royal and became from then on the Royal Irish Constabulary, the RIC. Now, in the early 19th century, um, even in the late 18th century, you have the emergence of municipal police forces. So Dublin, Derry, and Belfast each had their own police forces, which were overseen um, by the local council, if you will. Okay, by their, their local corporations. Um, uh, these police forces were relatively small and um, 
and, uh, and continued in Dublin. The Dublin Metropolitan Police, or the DMP as they were called, had been established in like the 1780s. Um, and in Belfast, the, um, the police force who became known as the Balkies um, were, um, were responsible for, um, for managing law and order in, in the streets of Belfast. But in 1864, the Balkies were abolished. This was because of a series of riots which they had failed to police effectively, and government commissions had come in and, um, and had taken the decision that the force was biased in favor of the Protestant elite, and that um, Belfast should be governed then by an extension of the um, RIC. And this is indeed what happens then. So after 1864, 65, um, it's the national RIC, who now um, govern in, in, um, in Belfast. Um, the same happens in Derry. In 1871, it loses its municipal force uh, and is taken over by the RIC. But the DMP survived until 1925, when it then merged with what was then the Civic Guards, and, um, and then eventually became uh, part of Garda Siakana. Each town's se uh, senior police officer was known as a commissioner. Now, the RIC in Belfast um, sort of struggled throughout the 19th century. They had a difficult relationship with the, um, with the corporation governors, um, and the Protestant population in Belfast was consistently hostile. Um, they saw the RIC as a Catholic force, um, which indeed it was, certainly at the rank and file at any rate, um, and, uh, and this created ongoing tensions. Um, and the police struggled then to try and manage their relationship with um, town governance. But the size of the force was quite significant. About one-ninth of the total RIC force was based in and around Belfast. Um, there were 25 stations um, in Belfast divided into six districts and about a thousand constables thereabouts with 30 to 50 um, sort of senior officers. Uh, Musgrave Street was a district and was considered to be the central station. And you can understand why when you realize that the old town hall was right next door, so it was very handy then um, for, um, for court work and all the rest. Um, so most of the constables who served in Belfast in the 19th century were Catholic and came from all across Ireland. The um, RIC had a policy of moving its staff around um, quite a bit, so most constables really only served in Belfast for about eight years on average. And what's kind of interesting, and I have shamelessly looted this from Mark Radford's pretty interesting study of the police in 19th century Belfast, which was is that morale was low in, uh, in and amongst the police in late 19th and early 20th century Belfast. Um, stations had been closing, there had been an attempt to try and uh, reduce the cost of policing. Um, that meant that there were fewer promotion opportunities available in Belfast. Paying conditions continued to be quite bad. The policeman's life was heavily surveilled. They had to live in barracks, and there was all sorts of rules and regulations about when and how you could live once you'd gotten married. But there was also a rising crime rate in general in Belfast at the time, which probably put pressure onto local constables and made them feel uh, anxious and worried, as well as trying to implement change um, was hugely difficult. By this point, the RAC um, and I feel like I'm talking about my own institution, was riddled with bureaucracy and, uh, and institutionalization, which meant that changes were difficult. Um, uh, the leadership was also heavily Protestant. Fergus Campbell has shown in his work how, in effect, a glass ceiling operated within the senior, senior leadership within the RIC, preventing much of the Catholic rank and file from rising up to senior leadership positions. Um, all of these sort of this discontent then um, uh, extended uh, or culminated in 1907 when local police um, embarked on what some have called a mutiny, others have called an agitation, what I would consider probably a minor strike of one shape or form. Um, and this then utterly destabilized, lowered morale still further. So. Um, the police force in Belfast was really having a hard time, and they weren't this um, a powerful, well-accepted force um, uh, in, in the town. And really, throughout this period, they struggle with being a civilian force, but yet having to operate in a semi-military context in terms of Belfast's ongoing sectarian um, uh, uh, disturbances. Um, 
What hammered the force still further across the island of Ireland was the outbreak of war in 1914, when many members um, went off to join the army or were killed then in the subsequent troubles that took place on the island of Ireland between 1919 and 1921. And this is what prompted then um, the British government to, um, uh, as, 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 as alongside its counterinsurgency policy, um, to deal with all of this unrest by creating what was called the Auxiliary <coughs> Division of the RIC. These are known more familiarly as the Black and Tans. Okay, so they were brought on board to try and supplement a weak and understaffed force. Um, and we all know, and I don't need to go into detail about um, the difficulties that that caused across the island as a result. Um, when partition then was implemented in, or was, uh, began to be implemented from about 1920, um, the decision was then taken to disband the RIC. And so in 1922 then the RIC were um, disbanded. And instead, you had then in the in the um, in era in the new um, Southern Ireland the emergence of the Civic Guards and the Garda Síochána, and then you had the emergence then of the RUC in 1922. So from about 1922, then the RUC within the six counties of Northern Ireland um, was a force of about 3,000 men. Within the ranks and file, there were roughly speaking around 10% Catholics. Um, but 30% um, uh, um, uh, of officers were actually Catholic. Now this was at, in 19, the 1920s. Over time, these proportions declined um, as the new force struggled, I think, with um, uh, credibility um, within the Northern Catholic population. But the force itself struggled um, in, the, in those early years too. Um, and of course it was the difficulties of dealing with um, the troubles and the disturbed state of the, of, um, uh, of the new Northern Ireland. And once again, um, an auxiliary force was brought on, and this, this time um, the specials, the A, B's, and C's. Okay. So I don't want to go into any more detail really about that, but just to give you the broad picture there. So, if, um, so what I want to talk about now is, is that, so where do women police come from? And, uh, and what, what are the, the drivers and the motivations for, um, for female policing? Um, is, as in so many things, the Americans are out in front, and the earliest female police officers attached to forces um, are in the United States, um, particularly Alice Wells, who was um, signed up to the Los Angeles Police Force in 1903, which is really very, very early. In Britain, it's really the First World War which brings about people's interest in, um, uh, in uh, female police. Um, but Irish newspapers were interested in what was happening, and so you had stories um, being reported of um, early female police officers and how they were going, and people asking questions about whether or not this was something that um, we should experiment with here. Um, the motives and the drivers then for female police are kind of various, and I'm just going to mention them uh, briefly. The first and the most obvious one really is the suffrage movement. Okay, as more women begin to demand more rights, so also they begin to look to uh, traditionally male occupations like the police force, like they had done for um, uh, looking to get access to education, and so they had done looking to get access to the medical profession. And so it's not surprising that many suffragettes, suffragists, and many women involved in, um, in equal rights um, campaigning begin to talk about and um, conceptualize um, women within the police force. So a lot of the suffragists within Ireland, Anna Haslam, Mary Hayden, and all the rest, um, were all talking about um, female police and the importance of female policing. Um, another strand, however, which is probably equally powerful, if not more so, was um, social welfare work. So religiously driven uh, work that women had done from within the churches, um, which had been focused on poor, the poor, on children, on um, uh, rescue work, which was a euphemism for dealing with prostitution, um, and, and other types of this kind of social welfare work. A lot of these societies and organizations in dealing with women realized that women had special skills 
that um, would be valuable if they could be part of um, official law and order. And so their idea was that um, it was essential for the protection of vulnerable children and young people, of vulnerable women when they were taken into custody, that they had a woman um, there to look out for their interests. And so here you have another driver um, for uh, the arrival of, the women, of women's police. But in this sense, as uh, Louise Jackson has argued in her book, um, women were seen to be um, important for the police um, because they were special, because they brought these different skills. It wasn't the, uh, an egalitarian argument, it was a complementarian argument. Okay? And within, with then the, um, with it, the introduction of khaki fever, and the concerns about women's um, moral and well-being on the streets of um, the cities across London with all the soldiers flying around and nobody looked out for, um, for anybody. Um, you had the emergence then of voluntary societies of, of women police. And the first one, um, probably the most controversial one, is the Women's Auxiliary Service, which was known initially as the Women's um, Police Volunteer Movement. This was set up by uh, Margaret Damer Dawson on the left and her friend Mary Allen. And um, uh, the, the Women's Auxiliary Service was, um, uh, um, was, uh, came from, the two of them had strong ideas about women, they had strong ideas about um, the suffrage movement, Damer Dawson, in particular, was associated with militant suffragette movement. Um, uh, Mary Allen uh, eventually toys with fascism and, um, and joins um, and becomes friendly with Howard Mosley later on in her career. So for these women, um, it was uh, about setting up an entirely separate organizational structure which women controlled um, and which would then negotiate with police forces for the availability of, um, of police officers. Um, the other organization which then set up to look after or to uh, promote the cause of, uh, of uh, women's policing was a voluntary organization um, no, set up under the auspices of the National Union of Women's Workers, um, later called the National Council of Women. And uh, this was um, a very wide-ranging organization based across the UK with local branches and their whole idea was to set up um, was basically to get women to come together to patrol the streets during wartime in the evening. Um, they would wear an armband, but they would be volunteers, so they wouldn't wear uniforms, and they obviously wouldn't be paid. Um, the women would go out in twos, um, and they wouldn't have any powers of arrest, but they were issued with a card which gave them the right to, um, if they approached a constable, that he, they would show their card and he would understand um, and be prepared then to support them and to take their recommendation about whether or not arrests should be made. Um, these women police patrols were probably the most common form of policing in World War I across uh, the UK. And, um, uh, and eventually when the war was over in the 1920s and the London Met begins to look at doing something more for women, it's this organization which they draw on um, for their um, for their person power and for their models um, and Damer Dawson's uh, women's auxiliaries um, uh, eventually um, fades away. Now, how do these organizations then interface with what's happening in Ireland? Well, both organizations had a presence here um, uh, in one way, shape, or form. Um, the uh, Irish women's patrol, so the patrol movement comes to Ireland, um, but is initiated by local suffragettes, just suffragists, in particular Anna Haslam, who I've mentioned earlier, who was very involved in um, suffrage uh, reform. Um, her whole idea, though, was um, quite different from um, the English movement. Um, it had, it, the intention was very the same, to improve the moral and social conditions of the streets and to safeguard young people of both sexes which could probably be anything, couldn't it? Um, they were to make friends with young people, to warn boys and girls seen to be behaving foolishly. So quite vague and generic, which Haslam had done on purpose in order to secure a wide base of support. 
because what she had done is once, once she had her idea around about 1914, she begins to write letters to the Irish Times, she begins to petition senior members of the police, uh, including um, uh, W.E. Johnstone, who was the commissioner of the DMP at the time, and, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so what happens is, is that an Irish women's patrol is set up, and um, women begin patrolling largely in Dublin and in Belfast. <laughs> Senya Pachetta has written a lovely article um, on the women patrol movement, which focuses largely on what happens in Dublin um, and, uh, and, uh, and things. But there's really very little known about the Belfast movement apart from really what we can find in local newspapers. Um, so the women patrol movement then is voluntary middle class women who had the time to devote to this kind of sort of surveillance on the streets. Um, and this is indeed how their work has sometimes been uh, interpreted. Sexual surveillance, sexual control. Um, uh, opponents at the time said, you know, um, there shouldn't be anything the matter with a, with a young couple spooning in a doorway um, and they should, without having a woman pouncing on them um, and carting them off to um, the local police station. And so there was this concern that this was a middle class attempt to try and uh, police the morality of, uh, of the working classes. But as Senia Pachetta argues, and others too, there was much more to it than that. A lot of these women were coming from their long-standing tradition and experience in social welfare work and in rescue work, and they could see the extent of abuse um, the vulnerabilities of young women, and um, were anxious um, that um, this the sexual double standard, which they had seen um, all around them, um, was not perpetrated even more during the disruption of wartime. And so, for them, it was really about protecting vulnerable women and trying to be women's advocates um, on the street. Um, uh, so, um, so that's the sort of patrol movement. The other movement then is the William, Women's Auxiliary Service, um, Damer Dawson's um, organization. Um, and uh, it seems that in 1920, because of the disturbed nature of, um, the, uh, of the southern uh, counties, that the senior members of the police invited um, Damer Dawson to send women to come and serve temporarily with the RIC. And, it seems that um, about 50 to 100 women first um, were sent across by Damer Dawson and um, they were attached then to various units across Ireland. Now these women be, were known as female searchers which meant that they were there to search um, anyone who was arrested as part of the, um, uh, as part of the uh, wider group's um, activities. So here you can see, so there's only one or two photographs, which again I have shamelessly pinched from irishconstabulary.com. Um, and uh, you can see here, there's the, the women's, uh, the female searcher in, um, in the center. Um, and she would have accompanied then um, these police as they went out on raids or, um, and the like. And if um, a woman's room needed to be searched or a woman herself needed to be searched, then that's what she would do. You can see another very dark photograph with the female searcher here. Okay. So these women were English, they were uh, part of Damer Dawson's organization, and they were brought over, paid by um, uh, the, uh, the local RIC, um, but eventually then um, their, their contract uh, was terminated, and we presume that most of them then uh, returned to England. Okay, there's again very few photographs of um, female patrols. So here you have um, female patrols, um, a photograph from the Belfast Telegraph of the female patrols um, from the time. And uh, again, just to say that this is um, uh, Jane Bell here in her constable's uniform and her colleague here, Mary Fallon. And I'll talk about them in a second. Okay, so. So let's, let me talk just, oh, I should mention one, my third sort of um, uh, 
which I've kind of mentioned already, which is the importance of um, religious uh, welfare work um, and, uh, and the extent to which um, uh, this also was, was an incentive. Um, so what you have here is a photograph of um, uh, William Collins, who was appointed to the Belfast courts as a court missionary. Um, uh, a court missionary was in essence a religious or a denominational version of a probation officer um, in that he was um, there to try and help manage um, people uh, uh, after they'd been released from prison and to try and deal with um, ex-prisoners um, and to prevent reoffending. On the right hand side you have Jane Bell but in her uniform as a deaconess. Um, from the Irish Presbyterian Church, where you had deaconesses um, were um, uh, emerged within the Presbyterian Church as a um, uh, as a professional role for women um, from 1908. It was a movement which had emerged in the 19th century, and the whole idea was to give women paid and full time opportunities to serve within their denominations. And um, so the Presbyterian Church then implemented deaconesses, as I said, in 1908. Um, they would go off and have some training. They would be trained in um, social rescue work as well as nursing. Um, and then they would be based in a congregation where they would assist the minister um, uh, to deal with all aspects of, um, of congregational life. So Jane Bell was attached to Nelson Memorial, um, which is now a closed Presbyterian congregation on the Shanko Road. Um, so you can imagine the community in which, that, in which she was um, doing most of her work. So if we look now at the actual female police, um, before I entirely run out of time, um, the impetus was, like I said, for, came from the, um, the, uh, <coughs> the suffragists in Dublin and the uh, members of the Irish Women's Patrol who were looking and had always wanted a professionalized uh, women's police force. And so they spoke with government officials and they gained the support of uh, William Johnstone, the commissioner of the DMP, and he then put pressure on the chief secretary and the undersecretary, who then had a chat with members of the treasury to see if there was any money for this, and as a result, um, the um, approvals for funding um, were put in place. So on the 22nd of January then in 1917, Treasury gave approval to um, uh, John Stone to employ two women um, as members of the DMP, as long as he was prepared to lose two male constables from his force so that the expenditure wouldn't really, wouldn't go up. John Stone, I think, felt that his force was probably understaffed anyway, and so he had two vacancies. Um, so it wasn't a case that he had to actually let two men go. Uh, and what then seems to happen then is, is because of the pressure that was emerging in Dublin, um, it, as an act of a parity of esteem, um, uh, the Belfast um, uh, police were then asked if they would then employ two women. And this is, and again, approval was given for this on the 17th of April, 1917. So the initial pay that these women received was meant to be 25 shillings, um, uh, 25 shillings a week, and it later, or I'm um, not sure about that actually, and uh, it later rose then to 30 shillings, um, but they didn't get a pension. Um, in Dublin, there was no pressure to um, wear a uniform, but in Belfast, the um, Belfast women um, distinctly request the, uh, a uniform. So one of the first female police officers then writes a letter um, to uh, to the, to the commissioner, T.J. Smith, at the time, and I beg to make application on behalf of Ms. Fallon and myself for some sort of uniform distinctive of our profession. Since taking up our duties in August, we have patrolled the streets regularly in the evening, but we find that our presence in plain clothes has little or no effect on the conditions, which are extremely unsatisfactory and dangerous to the young people who frequent the streets. We feel that our duty is prevention rather than detection of crime and are sure that our presence in uniform would affect this to a considerable extent, whereas without it, we have no means of showing our authority to the girls we have to deal with. They resent interference on the part of a private individual, but would give heed to a caution given by one whose authority they recognize. 
So in, there's all this chit chat about how much the uniform will cost and who will pay for it, but eventually the treasury gives in and, um, and pays for the women's uniform. All of these women um, were then um, sent off for training in, um, in either in Glasgow or in London for either three or six weeks, depending. Um, and when they came back, they then began um, to their active service. There's no doubt that there were early hiccups. Some of the early women who were appointed in Dublin were no good. Um, Johnston argued that the salary was too low and he couldn't get a solid enough candidate. So he asked for an increase um, and, and hires more women. But Johnston is throughout this period hugely complimentary about the work that the women have been doing. And the experiment takes off and it begins to work. So let's talk a little bit then about um, who these women actually were. So, so far what I've been able to discover is, is that these are the women who have been named as having served in, as police women in the DMP uh, between 1917 and 1958. Um, it's not clear to me necessarily um, how long some of them served. I don't know their first names necessarily and I've been unable to really identify them particularly very well, at least so far, right? There's always more time. But you can see that a couple of them who I've tracked down through the, uh, through the census, um, Mrs. Rutland in particular, turns out to be English, Church of Ireland, her husband's a storekeeper, uh, and Miss Edith Naughton, again, a Catholic, her father, an army pensioner. Miss Waters was the longest serving alongside Mrs. O'Neill. They um, are routinely reported as taking cases in the local press um, throughout the 30s and the 40s. Um, uh, but Miss Waters was the last to retire then in 1956-57. Uh, so, um, uh, the, in Belfast, it's a far fewer number, and I know a lot more about these women, so we'll talk about them for just um, a moment or two. Um, the first two women to be appointed um, under the terms of the Treasury arrangement with the, um, with the RUC, um, well with the RIC at the time actually, were Mary Florence Greaves and Mary Fallon. And so I'm just going to talk about um, Mary Florence Greaves resigns in 1917 and she's then replaced by Jane Bell who, um, who works then for, throughout the rest of the number of decades. When Mary Fallon resigned in, uh, retired in 1940, Catherine Carton then took over. And so that's kind of the, um, and really there are, there are no other women. So there's only these four women who actually ever serve in Belfast. And what's kind of interesting, I think, is the socioeconomic and religious background of these women. So um, Mary Florence Greaves is, um, a, is a member of the Greaves family, which were who were um, linen merchants. They owned and ran the Fourth River Mills on the Falls Road in um, in Belfast, um, a huge enterprise, and um, uh, which uh, dominated um, uh, the Falls Road. Um, they were extremely wealthy. They um, were one of the top 10 donors to the new um, Royal Victoria Hospital in the early 20th century. They donated over a thousand pounds, which only um, the, the largest firms in Belfast did at the time. Um, but what's even more interesting is, is that Mary Florence Greaves was Plymouth Brethren, um, which is a small Protestant um, uh, group. Um, which doesn't have an ordained ministry and is um, a small minority but influential within Northern Ireland. Um, her mother was um, a Gribbon, which probably doesn't mean anything to you, but to me means that she was a member of the Gribbon, uh, the Gribbon Linen family from Coleraine who were active Baptists and active in the um, Irish Baptist Association. So Mary Florence's background is, I think, um, imbued with a religious ethos and with a, with a public ethos as well. Her mother um, and her throughout the 30s and the 40s can be seen at a whole range of charitable um, events. But it's always kind of been curious to me as to why she resigned, doesn't seem to start to resign so quickly, until I discovered in the newspapers there that her brother, um, um, a flight lieutenant in the Royal Naval Air Force, was killed in action in December 1917. 
So I wonder to what extent that then put a different spin on her approach to what was her own career. Maybe she felt at that point that she needed to resign and to return to her family and, um, and to take up another different path. Um, it's interesting that her, she with her qualifications was prepared to take on board what at this point was still a pretty rough uh, and ready occupation. Um, Mary Fallon, I have been unable to largely, unable to trace really so far, um, definitively anyway. Um, rumors have it that her father had been a, um, a police constable in the RIC um, and, uh, and this may be the case. Um, she died in 1953 with only 300 pounds worth of effects, so she was clearly not a rich woman. Uh, Jane Bell then is, is obviously the woman who I know most about. She was born in 1887 in Ochtacloy in County Tyrone um, from a Presbyterian background. And as I said, she worked as a deaconess and trained as a deaconess um, between 1912 and 1918. Um, when she then resigned her charge at Nelson Memorial and took up um, the, the occupation of, um, uh, of policewoman. But what's kind of interesting and what I've talked about <laughs> elsewhere is that she maintained her affiliation with the Deaconess movement and, um, uh, and sort of occupied both roles, working for the Presbyterian Church with discharged prisoners from Armagh Jail, amongst other things. In 1933, she inherited um, a significant piece of property outside Lisburn. Um, in, uh, she resigned then from the police in the late 1940s, um, and in the early 1950s, she married a man called Robert Cheater, and, um, uh, uh, and then um, who, who predeceased her. She adopted um, a child as well along the way. And again, finally, then Catherine Carton who I have as yet been unable to trace. For a while, I thought her name might be Carson, actually. Um, so, so, unfortunately, um, some of these women are still quite mysterious, um, and we don't really know a lot about them. But let's look at, in sort of the few moments remaining at what these women actually um, got up to, and probably the, um, the reason why you came to the talk in the first place, which was to find out all about um, gypsy caravans. <laughs> because we know um, from the work of the women patrols and the evidence there that um, the female police, both in Dublin and in Belfast, were engaged in this type of activity. Okay? For the most part, they were there to look after, to care, to interface with and interact with female prisoners. Um, they would escort them from the jails to court, they would search them, um, uh, they would uh, accompany them and sit with them and so on. But their activities, as I've discovered um, through reading the local papers, it, um, was much wider. They were involved in all sorts of surveillance. So a surveillance in shops, um, and quite often they are up in court giving evidence um, uh, regarding shoplifting um, and passing of forged goods and documents and this kind of thing. Um, they, uh, they patrolled the streets in general, walked the beat. Um, they dealt with domestic abuse and assault cases, um, vulnerable children and young people. And most significantly, and probably most notably, um, is the, the work that they did for the detective division of the RUC, which was undercover work um, uh, to expose fraud, um, the sale of indecent literature, um, to try and um, uh, uh, control prostitution, and then most important, <coughs> I think most interestingly, fortune telling. So, um, uh, so I want to talk a bit about fortune telling, and I think this is fascinating. I don't really, I never really come across it as a particular crime. It's not anything that we, I don't know, the police here can tell me if we still prosecute um, fortune tellers, but the papers are riddled with um, uh, references to fortune telling. And the, most, the majority of, um, uh, of cases uh, seem to be mentioned, in, roughly speaking, around the period sort of 1910 to 1920, when there seems to have been some sort of a national craze for having your fortune told, visiting a gypsy, getting, um, uh, trying to find out about the future. And I wouldn't wonder why, with the war on, uh, people were worried about what was going to happen. But fortune-telling, at this point, came under two pieces of legislation, 
1736, 1736 Witchcraft Act, um, which extended penalties for the, towards those who pretended to exercise sorcery, witchcraft, enchantment, or conjuration, or it fell under the Vacancy Act of 1874 that people, by doing this, were attempting to exercise a subtle craft, according to the legislation, or deceitment, and that therefore they were categorized as a quote-unquote a rogue and a vagabond, okay, and could be, um, could be charged um, under those terms. And what's really clear is the, and, and what for the police was their real priority, is um, uh, the, this idea of trickery, um, and that people were being um, defrauded out of um, their money. And so there's just um, a, a couple of, uh, and you can see here how um, the, it's the female police, it's, Mary, it's Florence Greaves and Mary Fallon and others who are approaching um, uh, the gypsy caravan, pretending to be um, uh, pretending to be a regular visitor, having their fortunes told, and then um, uh, and then uh, arresting um, the women or making a recommendation for arrest um, thereafter. And then, of course, the, the, the case then comes up in court. So you can see here on the left-hand side in 1923, uh, Mrs. Ronnie Smith, a, a very popular um, gypsy and traveler name at the time, um, living in a caravan at Hollywood Arches, Belfast, failed to appear. Um, Policewoman Bell described a visit. The defendant asked that her hand should be crossed with silver, and the witness gave her a shilling. She was told that two men were after her, but was advised to wait, and she would make a better match in another country. And again, you know, I mean, the stories all become very, very similar over time, in that um, uh, you approach and you're told that there's a tall, dark stranger in your future and, and, and all the rest um, and, uh, and things. So, um, so, police, so Bell and Greaves and others all give evidence um, in Belfast um, uh, about all of these things. <laughs> and um, you can see here, uh, Fallon and Greaves went to the chapel fields where there was a long line of women and girls waiting to enter the defendant's <laughs> caravan. Once again, you can see the importance then of having a female police officer right, going undercover for this kind of work. Miss Fallon visited um, uh, Mary Brinkley, the gypsy, on the 12th when the latter told her her fortune by reading her hand. The defendant told her that she would have 14 years of good luck and happiness, for within two years she would marry a very wealthy man. And you can see the court, what they think about this, right? Laughter. The witness gave the woman six pence. Miss Greaves gave similar evidence regarding a visit to Madame Brinkley, um, and a sentence of two months imprisonment was passed. So these are all very typical cases. What's actually quite sad is the cases where it's um, a poor individual, um, like, our, um, like this person on uh, the right-hand side in this article here, who's trying to make money on the side. Um, and this is more common than where you find tea leaf reading. Um, so the, um, the de female defendant here, Mrs. Letitia Morrow, living at Broadway, um, uh, she was, she read the cups um, to uh, Ms. Fallon, um, and when Ms. Fallon went in, Mrs. Morrow said, Who sent you? I am afraid of strangers. There are inspectors going about. I hope you are not a spy. If my husband knew I carried on this sort of thing, he would put me out. And that would not suit, for I am the mother of seven children. I'm sure it wouldn't suit her husband either. Um, so you can see here that um, this whole idea of forgery and fraudulence is also about um, targeting um, what we would call the economy of makeshifts, the ways and means in which poor people were trying to uh, make ends meet. Um, so, just to finish off then, um, I should say, though, that these sorts of superfluous cases were made for great publicity, but the work that women did was really important. You can see here how uh, William Kennedy, found guilty of assaulting his wife, said that he's got to now live with the, uh, the memory um, uh, of what he'd done, um, and, uh, but that Miss Fallon, the policewoman, should take an interest in his wife and see if there was any chance of their coming together again. So you can see here how women police officers are then tipping over into what we might call probation or social welfare activity as well. 
And so once again, this notion of the female police officer isn't fixed and firm. It's still, um, in, in, it's still in flux. So how did people in the press relate to um, uh, police women? What I would say is, is that there's a gradual transition from ridicule to respect. If you look at the Belfast newspapers in the 1860s and the 1870s, any sort of reference to police women is a very mocking one. Um, no one can believe that there could be such a thing as a, as a female police officer. Um, uh, and uh, no one could even imagine. Um, uh, imagine what would happen if she was married and then she arrested her husband. What a to-do that would be, um, one newspaper article. Um, but over time, as women began to demonstrate um, their work, um, you could see how the, this, these attitudes began to change and um, to ones of genuine respect. Uh, by 1921, um, the police leadership in Dublin were giving public commendations to the work that Mrs. O'Neill and Miss Waters had done. Um, in an Irish Times article in 1931, um, it lauds the four women's good work for the city, um, uh, saying they do not talk, they act. Um, the humanitarian work that they do with children um, is unprecedented, and um, we, we don't even see them, they just get on uh, and, and do it. Um, we don't really see that kind of public praise in the press in Belfast. I think it's probably because the women were you know, just fewer in number, and it was maybe harder to see them. Um, and it's certainly true that it wasn't all rosy. If you read the Treasury reports, most of the time the Treasury is saying, um, uh, well, we're not going to give them equal rights under the civil service um, pension arrangements, that's for sure. I mean, we can't have women on the same terms as men, let alone the same pay. So you can see how there's this still institutional sexism behind the scenes. And if we look just in closing at Jane Bell's own reminiscences, um, you can see how, to a certain extent, bitter she was at what she perceived as the, still the institutional problems surrounding being an early policewoman. I won't read the whole thing, um, but uh, she said, uh, she talks about how hard her work was um, and uh, how she had to stand for long hours disguised as a poor woman, dressed up in a shawl, open to be insulted by public as well as policemen, ordering us to move on, not knowing who we were and not allowed to say. I also did duty for CID. Still, we had no standing being unattested. I also did work for the war office and investigated the abduction for the adoption of children. Um, working during the Troubles, obviously the 20s was the hardest. We risked our lives daily, worked hard, but made no headway with the government. The public wanted us, but had no power. However, I still know and believe that we were the pioneers of the splendid force of the women police in Northern Ireland. And although forgotten and paid off with a pension, that the cleaners in the office had more. So you can see how she worked really hard and she's desperately proud of what she'd done, but that institutional changes hadn't really come soon enough for her. So just to conclude then, women did a hard job um, uh, as um, the early female police in Belfast. They were isolated in a man's profession, and they were not entirely yet occupying the professional role that women police would take on board later. They didn't have the powers of arrest, and their work was restricted to women and children. Even though key supporters and leaders, both within the police and within wider society, called for more women's police, uh, more women police within the force. So these women, I would argue, are in a transitional phase. They're evolving towards um, that professional role that we recognize um, today. And some of them even occupied a dual role, still maintaining and hanging on to old occupations like Jane Bell did. They hung loose to their institutional authority, and that gave them lots of autonomy, but at the end of the day, little protection and little influence to be able to change the institution um, for what I would say would be the better. Thank you.